Hi everyone, I'm Miranda and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I finally got around to filming about all of the books that I read in April. I read quite a mixed bag of books in terms of some books are really quite dark and actually quite sad, but then I also read some really lovely light-hearted books which provided a welcome contrast. But I enjoyed all of the books that I read and I'm looking forward to telling you about them. So let's get cracking. The first book I want to talk about is Business as Usual by Jane Oliver and Anne Stafford. You might remember this book from my March book haul, I mentioned it in that and I know a few of you were quite curious about it and so was I, so I was really happy to read it in April. It's a really delightful story, it's set in the 1930s, it's told in letter form and it's about a young woman who has become engaged in Scotland but she has to wait for a year before she gets married and so she decides to not waste that year but to go to London and to get a job and she ends up getting a job in a department store that is a very sort of thinly disguised Selfridges. And it's just such a funny story. The letters in the book are about the letters that she sends back to her fiancé and to home, telling all about the adventures that she gets up to working in this department store. And there are very sort of funny anecdotes, and there are lovely illustrations throughout the book as well. The illustrations are by Anne Stafford and I, it was just such a light-hearted funny read. I loved hearing about what life was like in the 1930s. Um, she works in a, a sort of book department of Selfridges so of course that delighted my own bookish soul <laughs> but the characters that she encounters are quite funny and yeah it's just a really entertaining read. Read. There's also a very satisfying twist to the end because I have to say I didn't think all that much of her fiancé and when I was reading the book that was the one thing I wasn't enjoying about it so much but then there's this really satisfying twist to the story and that just made me enjoy this book all the more. So I highly recommend this if you just want something light and entertaining that will make you chuckle then this is the book for you. Next up, this was a reread for me, The Light Years by Elizabeth Jane Howard. Um, I reread this around Easter and it was just the read that I needed at that point. I know so many of you love the Cazalet Chronicles. Um, this is the first in the series. If you haven't read them yet, then definitely put these on your list. Um, again, this is set sort of just before World War II and it's about the Cazalet brothers and their wives and children and every summer their families go to the family home in Sussex and so this is really a sort of perfect late spring early summer read because there are all these descriptions of um, the countryside in the summertime, life at a sort of manor house in the country and it's full of fascinating period detail. I really enjoy that about Elizabeth Howard's writing and her books are so interesting because she writes from all different perspectives of members of the family and there's also a real upstairs downstairs feeling to the books and that you get the perspective of members of staff for instance as well and it's just got this real family saga feel to it and it's the type of book that you just get completely lost in the world that the author's created, you get to really care about the characters even though some of them aren't even very nice and they're all quite flawed, um, quite damaged in their own sort of particular way. Um, the men have, are damaged from their experience in World War One, and then there's this threat of war um, that's felt in this book and it's the sort of repercussions that sort of ripple out all through the family um, is really interesting. But it's just one of those books that you just curl up with on the sofa and you kind of forget everything else. You're just lost in the world of the Cazalets. And so this is the best like escapist type reading for me. So yes, I really recommend if you haven't read this, then do. And I'm really enjoying rereading the Kazlet Chronicles at the moment, so I can recommend to anyone who's already read them, then this is a good time for a reread. 
Okay, another light book that I enjoyed is Only You by, by Kate Eberlin. I actually just interviewed Kate for my podcast called Tea and Tattle, so I'll put the link to our interview in the show notes down below, in the description box. I always say show notes on my podcast, and I forget to say description box on YouTube sometimes. So it's confusing, what can I say? But anyway... I really enjoyed chatting to Kate about this book. This was a really fun read. It was, it's all about um, a young girl called Letty and a young man called Alf who meet in Rome. They meet at an Italian language class when they're both in Rome. And they've actually both escaped Britain for different reasons. Um, there are definitely some skeletons in both their closets. But they end up falling in love in Rome over the Italian language, over dance, they're both dancers, Alf is a ballroom dancer and Letty used to do ballet and he teaches her ballroom and they sort of waltz around a fountain in Rome and fall in love but then the past catches up with them and um, the rest of the novel is sort of about whether they can still make their relationship work and how they both have to grow as people themselves before seeing whether they can be right for each other. I have to admit I don't often read um I guess what would be cast like what what would be classed as chick lit or kind of romance novels and I don't read that out of like snobbishness. I just I don't know for some reason I don't ever tend to sort of go towards those books in the bookshops. But my experience of reading Only You was I actually really enjoyed it. It's a really nice sort of summer read. It made me want to read Kate Evelyn's first book, Miss You. And yeah, I just thought there was a lot to enjoy about this. That It also does describe some dar darker themes in the book, especially with Letty's storyline. Um, she's had quite a lot of trauma that she's had to cope with. And so it doesn't shy away from sort of bad things in life, but overall it's just a lovely feel good sort of read. So I really recommend this one too. Especially if you're a fan of dance, which I am, because I loved all the references to like ballet and ballroom dancing. That was really fun for me. Um, I read a Persephone book in April too. This one is called Wilfred and Eileen by Jonathan Smith. And I really enjoyed this one. I spoke about this one to my mum um, in our latest mother-daughter chat on Tea and Tattle, so I'll link that episode down below as well. But I really recommend this Persephone book. It's set um, just before and during World War One, and then you get a bit of a glimpse of life after the war too at the end of the book but this was actually based on a true story and it's a beautiful love story as well. It's about a young man called Wilfred who is coming to the end of his studies at Cambridge and during the May Ball he meets a young woman who's visiting a friend there called Eileen and he falls in love with her almost, at, it's almost a sort of love at first sight type of love. Wilfred is very ambitious though, he wants to be a doctor and he, well, he really wants to be a first class surgeon and he goes to London to study and his parents really disapprove of his match with Eileen. So they end up marrying in secret um, and eventually their marriage sort of does come to light and both their families end up having to accept the fact that they're married. But then World War One looms on the horizon, Wilfred uh, decides to enlist and he goes to France and there he becomes injured and Eileen extraordinarily manages to get a passport and she manages to get permission to travel um, which was really remarkable to be able to travel by herself as a civilian to France um, but she manages it and she goes to the hospital where, where Wilfred is lying injured and she really is able to advocate for him. She is able to speak for him essentially and to get him back to London where he can receive much better treatment and in doing so she really saves his life but he is partially paralysed and some of so some of the novel deals with 
his recovery but all of this happened it was a true story and I think what shines through is what extraordinary people ordinary people can be you know this is really a story about extraordinary ordinary lives which is just the sort of story that I really enjoy and both Wilfred and Eileen you can you just get a sense of the sort of people that they were from this and how extraordinary they were and what a wonderful love story this really is and there is a happy ending to this one too which I enjoyed um, but yes it's a lovely slim light read and I really recommend it Then I read The Mercies by Kieran Milward Hargrave, which I've been really looking forward to reading. Elizabeth McNeil, who wrote The Doll Factory, which I also really enjoyed, and I interviewed Elizabeth about her book, and at the end of that interview, she highly recommended The Mercies to me, which I already had on my shelf, but then I got it off my shelf and read it in April, and I'm so glad that I did. I absolutely loved this book. It's Kieran Millwood Hargrave's first adult book. She's um, written some wonderful sort of children's and YA, YA fiction already. This is her first adult book and it's based on a real historical event, um, which was really extraordinary. The book is set primarily in uh, Vardia, which is this tiny island off the sort of northernmost tip of Norway and it's based on an event that happened I think in um, the early 1600s on Christmas Eve there was this awful storm um, that ha occurred right off the island and all of the men of the island were out fishing and this storm blew up sort of in the blink of an eye and all of the boats sank and almost all of the men of the island were killed by this one catastrophic event. And then that event essentially sparked a lot of the witch trials that were carried out in 1621. And Kieran Millwood Hargrave starts with that incredible storm and then she tells the story of a young girl called Marin and another woman called Ursa who travels to the island and um, Ursa is married to, well essentially to a witch hunter. So it's a story about these two women and it's a love story between them. It's also a story of the witch trials. Um, it's a story about how indigenous people um, the Sami people in this case were persecuted in witch trials and it's just an extraordinary tale. I think she did such an amazing job at uh, creating a brilliant piece of fiction based from this true event that was so extraordinary. But yes, I really enjoyed reading this and I highly recommend it. It really sort of swept me up in the story and I had to keep reading to find out what happened next. Then another book I was really looking forward to reading because I had read so many great reviews of it was The Bass Rock by Evie Wilde. I always want to say bass rock but it's bass rock like the fish. <laughs> um, this was not what I expected it to be. I talked about this book too in my uh, March book haul video and um, it, w it just wasn't quite what I expected to be. It was much darker than I thought it would be, but I thought it was still a sort of extraordinary work of fiction, but there is definitely a real darkness to this book. Um, it's told sort of, the story is told through three different storylines and times. So there's a story about Sarah, who is um, being hunted as a witch, and then there's the story of Ruth, who um, has married a man just after the sort of end of World War II, so in the sort of 1950s. And she moves with him and his two children from his former marriage to this um, large house in North Berwick in Scotland. And then it, part of the story is also set in the present day um, with a young woman called Viv, who is going back to Ruth's house. Um, Ruth has just 
died recently in the present day storyline and she's going to sort of clear out the house and um sort through some of her own issues and some grief um that she's working through herself so there are three main storylines to the book but what the book is really about is um female trauma it's about violence against women. There are many murders in this book. Many women are killed in this book. And what links all of these women together is partly the, the place, um, the setting in North Berwick. And the Bass Rock is um, a real sort of rock that you can see just, just off um, the coast out to sea in North Berwick. But what really links this woman is place but also this sort of sense of anger and rebellion and trauma that they've all undergone and reading it it's it was really like reading nothing I'd ever read before it makes you think about these issues in such a compelling way um it also is quite a disturbing read for that I will say you know it's a difficult read in that way in that it's very hard hitting I found it very hard hitting anyway so it was a book that sometimes I had to just kind of put down and walk away from and just sort of reflect and kind of recenter myself before picking it up again if that makes sense um, because it's just really impactful so I really recommend it I think it's you know um, an extraordinary book to read um, but it's it is definitely quite a dark tale um, and it, it will I think really make you think a lot as well um, but yes I, I recommend it and then I read this book something sort of completely different uh, this is a children's book called Marianne Dreams by Catherine Storr I also told my mum about this book too in our tea and tessel chat I loved um, Clever Polly and the Stupid Wolf by Catherine Storr and actually that's kind of an interesting link to this book because um, sort of fairy tales and you know the darker element to fairy tales and wolves and, and women that really comes up in here too which is quite funny so um yes a twisting of a fairy tale definitely links to that book and I loved Clever Polly and the Stupid Wolf when I was little but this is another book by Catherine Storr called Marion Dreams I never had read when I was young but I picked it up to read, um, you know, very recently and it was kind of my bedtime read, just my really light read before going to sleep. So I read it in a few evenings and I enjoyed it. But again, I think it was it was a book that sort of just surprised me. It was different from what I thought it would be. And again, it was actually quite a disturbing read. <laughs> and um I wish that I'd read this when I was young because reading it as an adult I found it really quite a bizarre story and I think I would have found it quite frightening when I was young but it's hard to judge now maybe I would have just found it fascinating I don't know I wish I could have that child perspective on it it's about a young girl called Marion who falls sick and um, she's confined to bed for a few months so I mean it's quite a, a, an appropriate read in some ways right now too because it's definitely about being confined and what that does to you too and what happens to Marion is that she starts um, dreaming of a place that she's drawn with this sort of special pen that she finds in her bedroom. Um, she drew a house, a picture of this house, and then she, in her dreams, she walks through this house and it feels completely real. And then the next day she adds a bit more to this house, she draws a picture of a young boy and she draws some rocks. And then that night she dreams of it again and the boy is there. And it's this strange blending of like reality with this dreamscape that she encounters and both feel so real to her. And she soon realizes that the young boy in her dreams is actually a real boy that she's hearing about from their mutual governess um, who is also teaching this boy and he is also ill and confined to bed. And the house in the dream is actually very menacing 
frightening house and these rocks that Marion has drawn outside the house in a fit of temper one day when she's had an argument with the boy Mark the next day she draws these rocks as as having eyes like in the middle so they become very frightening things in the dream the children know that they're they're being watched by these rocks and that these rocks don't want them to ever leave the house so the story is really about how they manage in their dream world to escape the house and then in the real world how they both manage um, to survive their respective illnesses. So it's a very curious story but I did actually enjoy it but I'm dying to know if any of you ever read this please let me know especially if you read it as children and what you thought of it if it scared you then because I think it would be quite a scary read as a child and yeah reading it as an adult I just <laughs> found it very bizarre but yeah it sort of fascinated me at the same time. And then next up I read Hamlet by Maggie O'Farrell. This one was definitely a book I was really eager to get to as I know so many other people were as well and I'm so glad that I read it in April. Again I heard so many rave reviews about this book and it did live up to expectations. It's really well written. I mean I think Maggie O'Farrell is such an amazing writer. She's so talented. Hamnet is about the death of Shakespeare's son called Hamnet, um, you know, and that has been said to have inspired his play Hamlet. Hamnet and Hamlet are essentially interchangeable as names. And what Maggie O'Farrell has done with this story is not only has she told the story of Hamnet and his death, this is also really about the story of Shakespeare's wife, Agnes. Um, there's some discussion as to whether Shakespeare's wife was called Anne or Agnes and Maggie O'Farrell has gone with Agnes in this story and that's an interesting point I think because in fact there's very very little known about Shakespeare's wife, um, about even Hamnet and how he actually died so this really is a work of fiction but I think that Maggie O'Farrell has imagined these characters in such a fascinating way and she has definitely set up this story to be a book about Agnes not at all about William Shakespeare and in fact the name William Shakespeare is not mentioned once in the book um, even you know Shakespeare isn't mentioned at all um, so you do hear a bit from, from Shakespeare's perspective, but his name is never mentioned. And this is really meant to be a story about his wife. And it is quite a remarkable ode to this woman who, you know, has really been so neglected in history. There's so little known about her. And she's often, I think, been cast in quite a sort of well, she's been vilified, I think, quite a lot by historians. There's been a lot of arguments that sort of Shakespeare came to hate her, for instance, and she was older than him. And Maggie O'Farrell, I think, you know, chose to go an entirely different way. And she created Agnes as this extremely loving, um, wonderful person. I thought a real strength of the book was that she really brought the world of Stratford-on-Avon to life, their home to life. Um, it reads like a modern novel in terms of the language for the most part, but you can imagine the time and you can imagine the world that they're living in so well through Maggie O'Farrell's descriptions. I thought it was really interesting what she did with the character of Agnes. I don't know if I completely agree with it and in some ways I think she went slightly too far in my opinion and uh, in imagining Agnes as well I feel that she went with the idea of you know her herb garden and really really ran <laughs> very far with that idea um I to me this tips almost a bit into magic realism because Agnes is someone who you know she can just grasp a part of someone's hand and from that she can sort of tell almost everything about them. So she, there's almost this witch-like quality to her and um, she's 
all-knowing in that way to a certain extent. She's also very good with animals and you know, can, has this extraordinary ability with, with bees and there's a scene in the book where she feeds a squirrel from the window and the squirrel sort of runs up and nestles on her shoulder and for me personally that went a little bit too far, it made her just feel not quite such a real woman to me and I think I would have enjoyed it if I'd felt that she 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 was more real this made her feel a bit like a fairy tale type of character but I still really enjoyed it I still thought it was um, a lovely ode to Shakespeare's wife and I loved the beauty of the writing but if you read it I'd love to know your thoughts what did you think of Agnes did you love her character did you think there was something slightly strange there maybe it worked for you I don't know, I'd really, I'd love to hear your thoughts, so let me know about that. I read this at the very, very start of April, and it's Love After Love, Love After Love by Ingrid Persaud. Um, this is Faber's sort of debut, lead debut novel for 2020, so I was really excited to read it, and I thought it was such a great story. Um, it's set in Trinidad and it's written in a very distinctive voice with the Trinidadian dialect and I really enjoyed that. Um, it's, it, I loved all the descriptions of food. Ingrid Pusso is an amazing writer about food and that really comes out in this book. There are so many just amazing descriptions of meals. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that makes you sound a bit greedy, but I love it when authors write about food really well in books and I really enjoyed all the descriptions of like classic Trinidadian dishes in this. I thought that was amazing. I loved the language. It's a story about quite a dysfunctional family and um, it's really a story about both the importance of self-love and all of the characters in this have to learn how to love themselves and all of them have quite a difficult journey towards self-love. So it's a story about self-love and why that's so important and the title Love After Love is taken from a poem called by Derek Walcott um, which I think is also called Love After Love and that poem is a beautiful poem. Do look it up, it's a wonderful poem, and that poem is about, again, the importance of self-compassion and self-love and learning to love yourself and that being the most important relationship in your life, um, which I love, but this is also about the failure of love and how love sometimes fails even when you have the very best of, inten of intentions. There's a very fraught mother and son relationship in this book um, and there is real sadness in this book too. But my interview with the author will be going live on Tea and Tattle very soon, so I won't tell too much more about it now, um, because uh, we talk much more about it in my interview with Ingrid. So, um, if you're interested in this book, then I definitely recommend you check out my interview with her on Friday. And then finally, um, I listened to a couple of audiobooks this this month, well, in April. Not that many, um, I think because I was, I was reading so much and somehow it just, I don't know, somehow I didn't listen to a lot in April. It's just, it's been a very busy month actually in terms of um, doubling the amount of interviews I'm doing on my podcast right now. That meant I was doing a lot of recording and a lot of reading. But I did listen to The Warden by Anthony Trollope. This was like a re-read for me. I, I really love um, this book. It's the first in the Barchester Chronicles series. And it's just one of those sort of lovely comfort reads for me. And um, my favourite books to listen to are always sort of comfort reads essentially. I like to listen to the same books over and over again. So I'm also listening to the next one, Barchester Towers now, 
But I also listened to uh, Murder is Easy by Agatha Christie because I I love listening to Agatha Christie books, you know, those are always comfort reads for me so I often listen to them on Audible too and um, yeah, that was just a fun one. But those are all of the books that I read this month. I'd love to know what you read in April, if you have any great recommendations for me. Let me know if you've read any of these books and what you thought of them, because I'd love to hear your opinions, um, especially Hamnet. I'm really curious if any of you have read that and what your reaction to it was. So please let me know. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and please subscribe to my channel which you can do by clicking my face that pops up somewhere around here but yes I hope you enjoyed this and I'll be back again very soon with another video bye